Welcome to Blood, Guts, and Booze. I'm Olivia. And I'm Kendra. This is a paranormal and true crime podcast here to frighten you and make you question the world that we live in. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into this. Listener discretion is advised as these podcasts are not for the faint of heart, nor are they PG. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another week of Blood, Guts, and Booze. How has your week been, Olivia? It's been a rough week this week, Kendra, (laughs) for Olivia. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, just had an emergency, well, not an emergency dental issue. I had a clean-in, and a fill-in popped out, and now I have to wait a month to get the fill-in put back in, and I'm like, that's cool. (laughs) Life's very hard right now. I also enjoyed that you lost your mommy at Costco the other day. I did. I lost my mom at Costco yesterday. She was walking around with cheese in her hand, and I lost her. I still still say you should have went to the front and called for a missing child. (laughs) I told her that. I said, everyone in our group chat, uh, between me, Kendra, and Anna and Morgan from Horror vs. Reality, they were all laughing. They wanted me to go to the front desk and report, like, uh, you know, lost child announcement. For Olivia? Uh, my mom would have, she said that she would have known it was for me. (laughs) (laughs) And she's funny because I asked her, do we need one cart or two cart? Because I primarily was only going there for about five items, maybe six at most, but I could not, they were completely out of toilet paper. It pissed me off. And she's like, one cart. I only need like three things. I hadn't even put one thing in the cart yet, and she already filled half of it. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah. She's an interesting shopper. Every time, I just need a couple things. She'll do a whole grocery shop. Is it your Costco or hers? Hers. Oh, I was going to say you should bring me some time, because I've never been. You know what? I have a panic attack every time I'm there. It's busy. (laughs) There's a lot of people there. Like Ikea, almost. Probably worse. Oh, jeez. It's like Walmart on a Saturday at Christmas, like, all the time. Like, the day Ah. before Christmas, all the time. Okay. Yeah. It's very overwhelming. It's good to go when you need, like, coffee and shit, toilet paper, but, ooh. I understand. Okay, so, today, I actually have a requested case from my friend Emily. Hi, Emily. Hey, Emily. Thanks for the request. Oh, thank you. (laughs) It also works out because I promised to start doing more cases outside of North America. Oh, good. Uh, So today I will be traveling to Germany to tell you all about the Hinterkaifeck murders. I'm not sure if you all remember, but a few weeks back I did promise a German case soon. Yes, I do remember. So, Olivia, do you know this case? Possibly, because it does sound familiar. Mm. I didn't, so it was fun to learn. Um, but let's be honest. You'll start talking and I'll let you know if I've heard it before or not. (laughs) Yes. All right, so let's dive in. The Hinterkaifeck farm was built in 1863. Ooh, old. Mm Mm-hmm. It was located near the woods of the Bavarian town of Groburn, about an hour away from Munich. Uh, it was about a half mile behind, or hinter, <laughs> the town of Kaifeck. Sorry, that, that was a good, good. So good. this is where it got the name Hinter Kaifeck. Ah. It's, about, it's a place about a half mile behind Kaifeck. With a play on words. Yes. Now, in 1922, 35-year-old Victoria Gabriel and her two children, 7-year-old Cecilia and 2-year-old Joseph, along with her parents, Andreas and Cecilia Gruber, lived in the home. The family was known to keep to themselves. They attended church, and Victoria sang in the choir. I like how her name is spelt. Yes, it's V-I-K-T-O-R-I-A, and Google kept trying to tell me I spelled it wrong. Yeah, because uh, Victoria is my middle name, and there's a C in it. 
Yes. But I like it better with the K, and now I'm debating legally changing it to the S. Excellent. I think you should legally change your name to Bansuela, Consuela Banana Hammock. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like Phoebe from Friends. Okay, I'll do, whenever Nick decides to ask me to marry him, I'll do it then. And then I'll make his uh, shit bag. Or crap bag. Yeah, as was going <laughs> Nick should have to be crap bag. Well, I'm going to change mine to crap bag then. The family was, er, about a week before the murders, Andreas noticed strange footprints in the snow leading up to the house from the woods, yet none leading back to the woods. He told his neighbors about it, and one neighbor even offered to lend him a gun to defend his family with, but Andreas denied. I see my name and whoever you were texting a minute ago. Hmm? Oh, I told Nick that you were in the driveway. Ah. Now I'm just telling Candace how delicious this brown sugar oat latte from Starbucks is. <laughs> just out of the corner of my eye, I seen my name, and I was like, I'm not trying to read your text, but why are you talking about me? Oh, no. I just, because Nick's at work, <laughs> so I told him we were about to record, and I asked him to go get cat litter. Then I said, Kendra's in the driveway in your spot. He said, I'll let you know when I'm on my way home. Okay. Sorry, we can edit that out. Just it was That's bothering okay. me in my brain, and I was like, I need to know who <coughs> you're texting about me. <laughs> Kendra's a weirdo. I mean, I'd say that too, but. That's fair. Valid. And true. <laughs> Anyways, so he had also discovered a strange newspaper in the home that he had never bought, and depending on which. Um, source you look at, either one or several keys had actually gone missing recently. Okay. Yeah. The Grubers also had a maid who had quit about six months beforehand. She claimed that the house was haunted and that she'd constantly hear noises and voices in the attic. Ooh. Yeah. On March 31st, 1922, a new maid named Maria Baumgartner arrived at the home for the, her first day. Sadly, though, she'd never leave the property. Ooh. So neighbors started to grow concerned when Cecilia didn't show up for school on April 1st, and the entire family had missed church. Can you imagine if they were all like, April Fools! <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know if April Fools was a thing back then. I don't know, but I will spit out my drink when you said they didn't sell up for school on April 1st. And I was like, oh, that's something I would do. And I'd be like. <laughs> that is kind of funny. It is. Cecilia missed school again on April 3rd. And by then, mail had begun to pile up at the local post office. So everyone started to kind of wonder. Something's going on. On April 4th, a farmer who lives nearby named Lorenz. Lorenz. Schlittenbauer led Schlittenbauer Schlittle Schlittenbauer led a search party for the family. I'm trying my very best to pronounce all of the German names correctly. You do great. Thank you. The search party found a gruesome scene in the family's barn. All three adults in the family and little Cecilia were found brutally battered and covered in hay. Oh, well. I mean, side note, Levy's sound effects in the background were, are working really well with this case right now. Mm -hmm. In case anybody can hear crying in the background, it's just my dog. She's just sad she's in the other room right now, <laughs> away from us. <laughs> yes, because she wants to be all up inside us. She's, oh my God. She could be under the skin to be that close to you, she would. And still not be satisfied. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, inside the home, Maria and Joseph were both dead in their beds. Maria was covered by her sheets, and Joseph was covered by one of his mother's dresses. So, oh. everybody was covered after they were murdered. Mm, sounds personal. Mm-hmm. Because I do know... In cases like true crime, if somebody covers the person who's died, 
or they have killed, normally it's a very, very personal case. Like it's it's a sign of remorse. Yeah. Yeah, like they're they're feeling guilty about it afterwards. They got to cover it up, you know, kind of like oh fuck, but you know they still do it. Same with the the certain positions, like when you cross the arms and they're in their back and they look yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, you they want to give them that proper goodbye, I guess almost mm -hmm. without giving it to them. Yeah. So the autopsies were done by court physician Dr. Johan Baptist. Amula Cecilia Sr. had. Oh, gee, that's a fucking mouthful. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Cecilia, well, the way that my English brain wants to read it is Cazilia, but it's C Z L I A. Yeah, because it's the A with the, the yeah. double dots. Yeah. So Cecilia Sr. had seven blows to her head which left her with a cracked skull and showed signs of strangulation. Her husband, Andreas, had a face covered in blood and his cheekbones were actually protruding oh. from shredded flesh. Ew. Yeah. Victoria's skull was also smashed and her head had nine star-shaped wounds and the right side of her face had been slit with a blunt object. Oh. And funny thing, I wrote shit instead of slit. So excuse, <laughs> oh, no. excuse that on the blog notes. Her face had been shit with a blunt object. I mean, realistically, it works both ways, but... Uh, Whoops. Also, side note, I don't think I've heard this case before, so... Excellent. Whee! I love when that happens. It's believed that all three of them suffered from a blow from a mattock which is a pickaxe-like tool used for digging and chopping, huh. and that it killed them instantly. Yep, probably. <laughs> Fuck. Now, the last in the barn, young Cecilia, had a shattered lower jaw, and her face was covered in gaping circular wounds. It's believed that she actually went into shock and remained alive for several hours after being attacked, oh. laying next to the dead bodies of her family. She also showed signs of pulling out clumps of her own hair. Oh, pro stressed out. From, um, from the pain. Pain, she's trying to do something. Yeah, oh, poor thing. No. Inside the home were Maria and Joseph. Maria was killed by crosswise blows to her head, and Joseph suffered a blow to the face, both while in bed. Um, investigators first suspected robbery as the motive, the inter they interrogated traveling craftsmen, va vagrants, and several people from surrounding villages. Mm. A large sum of money, though, was then found in the home, so they abandoned that theory. Police were learning plenty more weird facts, though. Like, it's a super weird case. So first, neighbors had said that they had seen smoke from the oven during the days between the murder and discovery of the bodies. Hmm. Someone had also eaten the entire bread supply and recently cut meat from the pantry. Yo, this reminds me of the, um, Viscilla Axe, Viscilla Axe murders? Similar to that. Like, just how the person's... Now, it's funny that you mention that, and you will, I will tell you why later. Because just, just so far of, like, somebody living in the house, and it's it very, I can see the similarities in it so far. I'm glad that you made that connection. Oh, I've had the connection for a few, a few minutes now. Okay. So someone going by the home on the night after the murders had also seen somebody there with the oven burning. The person shone the light towards them, though, so that they couldn't see them, mm. almost blinding them. He claimed that the smoke had a really disgusting smell. Like, it didn't smell like normal. Burning bodies? But there was no investigation done as to what had been burning that night. Ew, I wonder if he was burning a body or some gross... But all of them were found. It's also weird that all... That um, four of them were basically led out of the home into the barn in the middle of the night but two were left in the house 
I find that the weird part. Maybe, real quick, before you continue, mm -hmm. maybe he led certain people out because he specifically wanted the certain people in the house so he could, because maybe those were the people that he really wanted, but he had to get the other people out first. Maybe. I just don't know why you have to kill a baby. I know. Both of them little babies. Yeah. Uh, they didn't do nothing. Now, lastly, the weirdest part. The farm animals and the Pomeranian watchdog were left unharmed. Pomeranian watchdog. Yes. They were oh, my God. No wonder why they died. Pomeranian can't do shit for mm -hmm. them. But they were left unharmed, and all the animals had actually been fed and taken care of in the days between the murders and oh. the discovery of the bodies, <laughs> including milking the cows. So it had to be somebody who knew what they were doing on a farm, at least. Yeah, it had to be someone who knew how to work a farm. And so far, it seems like it has to be somebody that at least the dogs are familiar with. Mm -hmm. Farm animals, they're going to be like, sweet food. Dogs? As a Pomeranian, a small, annoying, little yappy thing? Yep, 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 yep. I'm sure somebody would have heard the dog barking. Mm -hmm. It's high-pitched, annoying screech. If well, if it was an intruder and not somebody the dog knew. Well, there is one thing that like I I, I didn't put in my my case here, but I, I will. I did read so on one of my links that they did test to see if someone was disturbing things in the barn, and that's what led them out of the house. But the that's what I was thinking too. The distance between the house and the barn, someone was screaming in the barn, and you couldn't hear it in the house. So for one of the neighbors, they may not have heard the dog if True. you can't hear screaming from the house to the barn. True. Because mm -hmm. it's also in the middle of nowhere. Like, it's in the middle yeah. of fuck, fuck, nowhere. Hmm. So anyways, there was zero clear motive so far for the murders and no real leads. The police did form a list of suspects, though. And the first suspect theory is definitely the strangest, in my opinion, and I think you're going to love it. So a bit of bit backstory is that Victoria's husband, Carl Gabriel, had apparently died in World War I. Hmm. Uh, Victoria had given birth to Joseph during Carl's absence. People speculated that the baby was not his and that he had actually not died in the war. Hmm. According to this theory, he returned to find out that Victoria had given birth to a baby that wasn't his, and so enraged by this, he murdered the family. Possibly. The theory also stated that the baby was actually Victoria's father's baby. Ew! And Andreas was raping Victoria, and as a result, they had actually been charged with incest in 1915. Oh, that's good, because I feel like even back then... That sh you had to have been to do something really bad if you got charged even in 1915. Yeah, Victoria served one month in prison. Yeah, she served a month in prison for being raped by her father. What the fuck? Olivia almost left. And Andrea served a year. Yeah. Hopefully that law has changed in Germany now. Um, where I really hope so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I mean, it was 1915. I'll give them that. You know, that's really fucked up, though, that she had to go in jail for being raped. Yeah, because it was by, it was par because of a, a result of an incestuous relationship. Yeah. But still. But that's 1915. This happened in 1922, so it would mean like five years later because Joseph was two, that they were still having sex. Or at least she was still being raped. They still had that type of relationship in order for Andreas to father her baby. Was the theory. So multiple men from the military confirmed that Carl had died in the war and that they had seen his body, even though other sources say that his body was never recovered. Hmm. But multiple men testified like, no, we seen his body, he died. Mm -hmm. With this theory also comes a murder-suicide kind of theory. Um, that Andrea's violence basically escalated to this point. Or Victoria had finally snapped from the abuse. 
Maybe. But none of the injuries could have been self-inflicted, so mm. this theory was shut down very quickly. Okay. Now, next, we have Lorenz Schlittenbauer, because, of course, the man who led the search party and discovered the bodies is a suspect, hmm. but not for the reason you may think. Okay. So, Lawrence was also suspected of being Joseph's father. He and Victoria had dated. Uh, Victoria and Lawrence had both publicly called him Joseph's father, hmm. and they had actually planned to get married until Andreas interfered and the relationship ended. Now, Lawrence married someone else, and... I can't have my daughter. Nobody can. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh. So, Lawrence actually married someone else and had another baby. Sadly, though, the baby only lived a few weeks. Oh, so sad. Mm -hmm. Lawrence was the police's number one suspect for the crime. They theorized that he was so traumatized by the death of his baby with his new wife and didn't want to pay child support for Joseph that he just murdered the whole family to make okay. it go away. He was also suspected because the people with him when the bodies were discovered um, described him as far too calm. He wasn't repulsed by the bodies. He touched everything. Um, he also knew his way around the farm. And he also had a key to the house. And remember, keys have gone missing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, too, people do go through shock differently. Everybody exactly. does, right? Somebody could... Because I know this happens a lot. They always go for the person as a suspect who, even though they went through something traumatic, they're just standing there with a calm composure. That would be like, me. And they're like, something's fishy about this because... You know, like you're, you're their husband just died. Like, like imagine, like Ron just died, and you're just sitting there with calm composure, and they're like, "Hey, something's up." I'm like, what the fuck? And you they're push like, him down "She's our number one suspect now because she should be freaking out, not yeah. sitting there like." But shock's different for everybody, I'm especially good at internalizing. Especially my like when you're already somebody. Not saying that you are, but like if you're somebody who's who already holds everything in, like emotions and stuff like that, you're probably going to process shock the same way, right? And not freak out. Yeah. But it does seem suspicious that he knows his way around and has a key. Yes. <laughs> Um, he, uh, it was also theorized that it was the, um, because it was a missing key, but he could have also had one because of his relationship with Victoria. Yeah. And because he was a neighbor. Because, you know, back then you, you were very much more trusting of your neighbors. Well, not just that, but like, they could have been like, they could have been like, hey, I have to go away for a week to do trade-in shit. Okay, it's not that old, but you just, you know what yeah. I mean. Like, here, take my key. I need you to milk my cows for the next four days till yeah. I'm back. Like... Mm -hmm. Um, he was questioned multiple times, but he was never charged as the police could never actually place him at the home during the time of the murders. There are also at least six incidents, like many other cases, where people blamed others and family members for being the murderers. Mm -hmm. uh, some deathbed confessions, local gossip, and rumors, but yet no actual answers. Um, the farm was torn down and replaced with a memorial in 1923. There is also a memorial for the victims in the cemetery where they are buried, and Maria was buried with the family. Oh, the files for the case were officially closed in 1955, but the last interrogation for the case actually took place in 1986. Okay. Mm -hmm. In 2007, German students investigated the case. They ruled out all but one suspect. Mm -hmm. The suspect was dead at the time, though, and out of respect for the suspect's family, they never actually publicly named them. Okay. 
And in 2017, hmm. a book by Bill James mentioned a theory that German serial killer Paul Mueller was responsible for the crime. Paul is most famously responsible for the Vasilla Axe murders. Hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Now, there is a few points of trivia, and there's a couple that I think you're really... The last two, I think you're really going to like. Okay. So, the strange newspaper was from Munich, and no one in the air area actually subscribed to it. Okay. In the middle of May 1927, a stranger stopped at a residence of Wadehoden, which is another town, at midnight. He asked him some questions about the murders and then shouted that he was the murderer before he ran into the woods, never to be identified. You want another trivia fun fact? What? I'm the murderer! <laughs> Run into the woods, Olivia! <laughs> <laughs> In 2009, the movie Kafek Murder was inspired by the Kafek, Hinter Kafek murders. Joseph's true father is still unknown. The family was buried without heads. Okay. The heads were cut off after the autopsy and sent to a clairvoyant in Munich to be examined for metaphysical clues. The skulls were actually lost during World War II and never recovered. The end. That, that doesn't even make sense to cut somebody's head off after an autopsy to send to a... What the fuck? It was, it was the 20s, man. True. This is when spiritualism was, like, right getting into its... It was, like, 100 years ago. Almost exactly a hundred years ago. Literally. <laughs> well, it's 2022 now, so yeah, it would have been a hundred yeah. years ago when all this stuff kind of happened, yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, that's the one where I was like, she's gonna love oh, that weird point. I... But then because... I wonder of, if the farm's haunted, or like, the, where, like... I'm not sure. Because if they're buried, like, were they buried on their property, or no, was in it... in a cemetery. In a cemetery. Nearby? I'm not exactly sure. I would exactly assume sure. probably somewhat nearby. But if they are literally missing their heads, I feel like none of them have been able to move on because I they're missing their heads. Especially because the heads have never been recovered. No one knows where the fuck they are. Somebody because probably has them as a goddamn prize and they're creepy ass. It's probably Zach Baggins and his music. I'm just joking. No, it, it, it's not it got lost during uh, World War II, during like all of the Nazi raids and things. They got stolen during that. Mm. And then they never so figured Hitler out. has them. Mm -hmm. And we don't know where he is either. Yeah. Africa. He's <laughs> dead. He moved to Africa. He's with Elvis and Michael Jackson down in Atlantis under the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's where um, Nelson Mandela was for those few years. But African? He, no, he was with all of them. Oh, yes. In Atlantis. He just somehow came back. Oh, yes, because of the Mandela effect. Yes, yeah. yes. That was interesting. I thought it was really interesting. I'm really glad that Emily suggested it because she, she messaged me and she's like, have you heard of this case? And I was like, mm, no. And I started kind of like, I did like a quick brief read and I was like, mm, kind of already reminds me of like every time a full family is murdered and it's unsolved, my brain automatically says Black Donnelly's. I don't know why, but it always does. And so I was like, mm, okay, it's basically the German Black Donnelly's. Not a big deal. And then I read more and more and more, and I was like, what the fuck? This is such a weird case. It is. It's really weird. Like, And I got to go to Germany for the first time. So, yeah. You know, <laughs> crossed off another European country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That case and, um, this, this, oh, my God. Vasilla, 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 Axe Murder. Vasilla. Vasilla. They do have a lot of similarities between them. Mm -hmm. um, because 
I'm pretty sure it was same with that case. Somebody was taking care of the house and the farm for the few days before the family was found. Yeah, he would stay in the houses, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so... And it wasn't the only one, because he had done a few others. Yeah, there was a few in the area and and stuff like that. Yeah, in like a 10-year span or something. But it didn't start until after he had left Germany, and while he was in Germany, this happened. Mm -hmm. So... It's widely, sus- or it's, it's not widely, what? but it's... Suspected it's, he's... The one guy made a connection that it could possibly be what, you know, which I think is probably my favorite theory, other than the dead husband rising from the dead to murder his family. Yeah, obviously it was a zombie that did it. Yeah, I mean, how can I not like that theory? I mean, that's why the heads are missing. He was hungry. Yeah. And take a snack for the road. Mm. Anyways, tell me about your um, case, please, today. All right. So, I'm keeping us in America this week. Uh, And I will be telling us about the Hobo Hill House in Jefferson City, Missouri. Take me down to Jefferson City. Missouri. Um. <laughs> Where the house is filled with hobos and hippies. <laughs> uh, that, okay, let's remix that song. Um, so I the, sound just like Axl Rose. You do. Sign Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. Where's their fucking label? Yeah. Uh, yes, queen. <laughs> Well, you want Queen, all right? No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't nail Freddy, sorry. He died. I mean, he probably could if he was alive. Uh, but he was all about the dick, and you know that, okay? I know. Like, all about the dick. But he loved everybody. He loved everybody. Oh, him and his, he seemed pretty into his husband. Oh, I know, I know. Wonderful man, though. Oh, my God, legend. Meatloaf died. I know, what the fuck? Two, two celebs died yesterday. Yeah. Meatloaf and Louis Anderson. Yeah, what the fuck? It's COVID things getting... Everybody dying. Knocking fuds. Betty White died, and my mom, she said that... Because I'm like, everybody's fucking died since Betty White died. And she's like, yeah, she was holding back the Grim Reaper. She was. And as soon as she finally just went with him, now they've taken Bob Saget, Desmond Tutu, fucking... Sydney Poitier, Poitier, um... There was a Disney star. There was a fashion designer guy, uh, Louis Anderson Meatloaf. It was only the 22nd of January, right? Now, and, uh, Bob recording. Saget. Yeah, you just said Bob Saget. Okay, yeah, and Disney star. Yeah, there was, like, um... She, uh, um... Kim Mi Soo, South Korean actress who appeared in Dis- appeared in Disney Plus series Snowdrop and Hellbound. January six, at age twenty nine. Oh, I don't know. Oh, maybe. Oh, on Cameron Boyce, I was so sad when he died. Oh yeah. Oh. But anyways, so the Hobo Hill House is a two-story red brick house located in Jefferson City, Missouri, by Adolph and Boyla, Boyla, uh, Beulah, Beulah, Brendan Berger. Okay. They owned a local pharmacy. Are they German? I would assume so. Because that's perfect connections. I mean... Adolf is a generally German man. And Brandenburg Burger sounds very German. I'm sure Bula. it's Brandenburger. Um, that sounded more like the Terminator than German. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they owned a local pharmacy. They resided in the home from 1910 to 1922. Weird. Weird. How do we do this? Multiple. This happens a lot, too. Weird. It's like we're syncing up, man. Multiple residents have moved in and out of the home since. And the house is located in the Hobo Hill Historical District in Jefferson City. Now, will you explain to me why it's called Hobo Hill? Um, 
I did not look that up. I think it's just the name they gave the area because it's a historical district. So okay, the Hobo Hill House because it's in the Hobo Hill Historical District. Okay, I was just wondering if there was still, like some weird um, homeless or hobo. <laughs> you just, um, hobos hanging out all over the place. So like history <laughs> with it or something. Um, no, but I can look it up and let us know. Okay. Uh, so. We're going to jump forward to 2017. Weird. Yours was also in 2017 when something happened. Yeah, that was on the last point in my case was yeah. the book. So, looking for a fresh start in 2017. The house was purchased by Aaron and Aaron Clark. Okay. Who, they remodeled this house, gutted it completely. They wanted to add their own personal homey touch. And for them, it wasn't just a flip. It was going to be their dream home. Hmm. Erin, the wife, wanted the house to still also preserve that historical style, but with, you know, a little bit of modern spice. All right. So it's got that very classic but modern look to it. I've seen the inside of the house. It's actually beautiful, to be honest. Hmm. <laughs> um by October 2017, the construction was finished, the Clarks had fully moved in, but soon their dream home turned into a house of horrors. And within six months, the family had actually left their house. <clears throat> Amityville. Mm-hmm. Now, what is so scary about this house? Like, was it really that bad that they had to move out in six months? Were there a lot of homeless people? I they know. took our jams. Um, so <clears throat> one thing that does make it creepy in the house is the fact that there's a giant like wet spot on the basement floor of the house, and no matter how many times it's clean, it always comes back. Ow. Levy sounds like a ghoul in the background, just oh. like and rumor had it that one of the previous owners that used to live there had walked his daughter away in the basement while they resided in the house. Okay. I couldn't find anything on that. Um, it was actually a lot more difficult finding the background on this house than I thought. Because <laughs> I actually had got this case recommended to me by a co-worker named Sarah that I work with. Um, she saw it on social media, on a video, and asked if I could cover it. Mm. Shout out to Sarah! Mm -hmm. Now, theory. Because I always have these weird-ass theories with your thing, right? And I'm slowly learning more and more about your haunting ghosty <laughs> You said that there was a, a spot in the basement that's always wet. And one of the previous owners had locked his daughter in the basement. Mm -hmm. What if, because she was locked down there, she had to pee? Possibly. Maybe that's the spot where she just always peed, and it just keeps coming up almost like a... Um, what's that thing like where... cat pee when, like, in a house when you have previous owners that have cats and if they've sprayed, you no, know, they... Well, I was thinking more like, uh, what's that thing where ghosts are just, like, on repeat? Oh, like a residual memory. Yeah, where the residual memory of it just keeps coming up. Could be ectoplasm. Maybe. Ghost goop. Mm. That's my, my weird theory for the day. Um, so things started getting weird. Lights would turn on and off. Same with the TV faucets. Items would move around the house. They would see shadow people out of the corner of their eye. They experienced overwhelming emotions with each other. So classic haunting. Classic haunting. The family had claims of hearing voices. They would hear hi when they would come home, like when they'd walk through the door. They'd hear hi. Oh. Hello. Yeah. Bonjour. Um, a tall man in a suit with a top hat was seen in the corner of the room. I literally wrote underneath, I'm the hat man. Because I was like, what the fuck? I was going to say, didn't you already talk about them with like the sleep paralysis one? About shadow people and the hat man. And mm -hmm. Interesting. <coughs> Sorry. Please stop dying. 
Because it's so cold outside. I mean, at least your cases are both written right here, so I can read the next two if I have to. <laughs> you know? But after that, I'm screwed. Yeah. Uh, so their daughter would experience night terrors, sleepwalking, physical injuries. She would also start talking in tongue. Ooh. So that's pretty fun. Uh, the Clarks were afraid their daughter was on her way of being possessed by spirits. At this point, I would say she was currently going through oppression. Have you ever actually seen someone talking in tongues before, like in real life? I have seen a video of exorcisms where people talk in tongues, and it's disturbing as fuck. But have you seen it in real life? Not in real life. It is the weirdest experience, I'm telling you. Like, um, when I used to go to church, I used to go to church, guys. Um... <laughs> I know, it doesn't seem right. We had it. a couple people that in the middle of prayers and stuff, they would just go I, I, into it's like, like the, holy shit. And apparently it's just, it's this thing where God overwhelms and you speak in tongues and it's a thing. I mean, at 16, I was like, what's that fucking weirdo doing? And I thought that a lot of people were faking it, but it's, it's weird and spooky and scary. I, I don't like it. Yeah, it, well, and their daughter is young. Your yeah. daughter's young. Yeah. yeah, if my kids started doing that, I'd be like, oh, uh, uh, I'm, I'm getting a bucket of holy water and you're living in it for like the next year. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> he had his face in my purse. Oh. Uh, when their daughter would stay at her grandparents for the night nearby, she was perfectly fine. But the second she would come back home, things would kind of start up again. So then it's not her mental health, it's the house. Rule it so, out. So, one event Aaron had with his daughter when he was walking into her room one night. She was standing beside her bed, looking out the window. He heard her crying and asked if she was okay because he thought, you know, her nightmares were getting the best of her. Yep. Yeah. She turned around and had what he described as a Cheshire cat smile. Ooh, I love it. Yeah, creepy. Uh, and he was terrified after this. Now, what was so scary for this family was the fact that they felt nowhere inside of this house was safe for them. Yeah. But, and the activity mostly happened in the bedroom, on the stairs, the attic, and the basement. Okay. Uh, these areas often, uh, sorry, when they would be in these areas, they would often feel dark energy. Yeah. The family's dog wouldn't even go into those areas. That's when you know it's spooky. Mm-hmm. When the dog goes, uh, nope. So, later on, the renovation workers came forward and were talking about their experiences as well. Some of the workers felt like they were being punched in the torso, would turn around and see nothing there. Okay. So that's pretty creepy. Um, after being so scared of their own home, the Clarks consulted a medium to come in and cleanse. With multiple cleansing attempts, the spirits took the house kind of for their own. One night was so bad that every object in their house turned on they call this the loudest night they felt as if the house was just screaming at them to get the fuck out that's fair the next day during breakfast they decided it was time to pack their belongings and leave that's fair <laughs> I messed up your drawing how long is your hair I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> Kendra's drawing. She's sketching me right now on a piece of like paper. Like one of my French girls. Yeah, she's drawing me like a French girl. Um, I'm not letting you see it now. <laughs> she's upset because I took my hair out of the ponytail and she's drawing. <laughs> so, the next day during breakfast, they decided it was time to pack their shit and get the fuck out. Fair and valid. The house is now rented out as an Airbnb Ooh. due to it being way too haunted to sell. And they also don't want to put another innocent family in the same situation. That's, that's fair. Yeah. Completely understandable. 
the clerks were amazed with how sick people in the world are wanting to pay money to live their experience in that house. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first group of people to stay inside of the Hobo Hill house left before the night was even over. Hmm. One of the ladies in the group saw a dark figure on a staircase. Another group member saw a dark figure on the porch of the second story master bedroom. Mm -hmm. The young man with the group uh, was smelling sulfur. They checked in at 6 p.m. and left just after midnight. Jeez. Every guest experience is different. Uh, Sometimes the spirits don't even come out to play. Aaron says about 95% of the guests have some sort of experience inside of the house. Another guest that had stayed in the daughter's room for the night heard children running around the room all night. Another guest left a note saying that she enjoyed her stay and her talk with the floating lady above her bed. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, I also came across a Cosmopolitan article where the author had went and stayed the night in the Hobo Hill house. She brought her mom with her. Um, They didn't experience anything creepy. They attempted to use an app on their phone that was a Ouija board app. Okay. But nothing happened, and they actually had a pretty enjoyable time. This house was featured on an episode of The Dead Files. Have you ever heard this show, Kendra? Uh, I've heard of it, but I've never actually watched it. So, the episode is called Not My Child, and it has Amy Allen and Steve... Deshivy? Deshivy? Sure. Uh, They investigate separately. Amy is a medium, and Steve is an ex-detective. Okay. So, Amy shows up to the house, instantly has a feeling that she's... Something's trying to push her out of the house, like keep her outside of the door. Amy keeps seeing what looks like a doctor in her visions... She has been feeling that she doesn't like him. He's dangerous. He states he enjoys causing fear and has a blast scaring the family in the home. Okay. Amy explains the doctor-like man she is seeing is the shadow that likes to charge out of the bathroom towards the clerk's bed while they're they're in bed uh, to scare them. And he can be physical towards the family if he wants. Amy says that he is examining them, but doing it very inappropriately. So if he's a doctor, instead of doing a regular physical, he's just like, hey, you know what I mean? Oh, she touched my leg. Amy has another vision of a teenage boy being thrown down the stairs, and she sees him and his father in the attic. She says that the teenage boy has brain damage in the afterlife, so it's very hard for him to communicate, and he gets very angry and lashes out. Basically a temper tantrum. And paranormal things start to happen, like door slamming, lights turning on and off. Sounds like things are moving, being slammed around. Like, he's he's not happy. Okay. Nobody can hear him, so he would flip a whole fucking table if he could. Okay. She also sees an older lady who gets very upset, wants her property back. Like, this lady is pissed. Amy also ends up meeting up with a sketch artist and has the artist sketch out what she envisions. And the artist actually sketches out the black shadow mask that's coming out of the bathroom towards the bed. Oh. Steve then comes in and interviews the clerks. Uh, He first sits down with Aaron, and she tells him about her entire experience, how much anxiety she has in the house. Aaron explained a nightmare she had about a mother on the stairs holding a baby and then smashing the baby's head on the stairs. Mm Mm-hmm. She has also felt dark masses smothering her in her sleep. 
So very similar to like a sleep paralysis yeah. situation. Yeah, no. Um, and like from all of this, I can understand why they don't let people live there. Because that's that sounds terrifying. Mm-hmm. Steve also interviews Aaron's daughter. And I want to say sh- at the time of this interview, which was back in like 2019. Mm-hmm. Her daughter was probably about eight years old, seven or eight. Okay. Like, she's young. So, for all this weird stuff to be happening to her at such a young age, like, that's hard. Um, Their daughter says she's very scared, and she didn't want to come back even if it was okay for them to, because she no longer wants to hear the voices anymore. Oh, Steve then moves on to interviewing Aaron, the husband, and he has his experience told. He says that every time he enters the basement, it feels something is holding onto his back, like as if something's on him like this, holding down. Ooh. Yeah, like holding That's onto his nice shoulders things. and like holding onto his back. Um, he also said he will not return if the house is safe to do so. Um... So, because Steve is a detective, he decided he was going to look into more of the background of the house, the history of the area, etc. He actually found out that the prison is, there's a prison located down the road from their house. Okay. It had absolutely terrible conditions, malnourishment, lice, illness, abuse, over 2,000 inmates died different ways. Multiple riots had happened. Uh, it, it was not a nice place. Steve found out that a lady in the area named Violet Ramsey mm-hmm. had owned the property next to the Hobo Hill house. She was born in 1796. Mm-hmm. Brought to Missouri by her slaveholder. Eventually she was able to buy out of her enslavement. Yep. And she bought this house. She was, like, well, she bought a house. She built a house or bought a house that was there previously. Um, She was eventually able to buy her husband and children's freedom. Mm -hmm. And she was just a laundress. Like, that's all she was. But she worked hard to get this property. And that there is probably one of the most positive things I could say about this entire house. But I want to throw that in. Mm. Now, Steve also found out about a man named Philip Thomas Miller, who had acquired the property in 1859. He had also worked at the prison down the road. Okay. He had buried four of his children on the property, Mm. and he was in debt for $644 back then, which today is like a bazillion fucking dollars. What year was it? Uh, 1859, he was then forced to sell his property, and life just kind of went in the shitter for this guy. His daughter, Louisa, yeah, bought the property back, moved their family back. She had lost her baby and then her father in a very short time period inside of the house. She then lost the property and had to move to a house next door and she had passed in 1926. Now Louisa was a very determined woman. She loved this property and she would do anything to get it back. Hmm. By the way, just under 10 grand. Perfect. Uh, So Amy and Steve then get together with the clerks and reveal the information they have uncovered. Mm -hmm. Aaron explains how he hears, um, he hears from the attic what sounds like somebody having a temper tantrum when Amy says her information about the teenage son and yeah. his father up in the attic. And Aaron, both of them, Aaron and Aaron both confirm what she is saying. Like, there's something up there. At one point, Aaron said it sounds like somebody grabs a box and just slams it on the ground sometimes. Jeez. Yeah. So, so far, that seems to cooperate. Amy then talks about the older woman she saw. 
and how she would cause nightmares and that she was determined to get her house back. Mm -hmm. Steve then reveals his information and after they reveal pictures of her, it's the same woman. Weird. Because when they show the picture of Louisa to the Clarks, yep. Aaron, the wife, confirms it. She's like, I've seen her. Weird. She's the one in her nightmares. That is so spooky. She, yeah, she's the one with the baby on the stairs in her nightmare kind of thing. Um, the black shadow mask that was sketched out was also confirmed by the Clarks. They uh, they confirmed what Amy had seen. Uh, Steve never found any information on a father and son inside of the house, but the information between Louisa and her father seemed to cooperate very much. Yeah. Because the doctor figure that um, Amy had seen mm -hmm. is Philip. Because when Steve brought out his picture, both the clerks confirmed that he was the hat man that they had seen. Weird. So they're they're very unhappy that there's people in their house and they want it back. Boy. Um, okay. So Fair, quick I little guess. fun facts before we wrap up. It was this, the Hobo Hill House was featured in a New York okay. Times article along with articles throughout the UK and New Zealand. Interesting. Yup. And I had never heard of this case until about a week ago. <laughs> huh. Um, so like I said, it's an Airbnb. Some guests have rented the house out for bridal showers and even holiday dinners. That'd be you. It would be me. And so the Hobo you. Hill House has a five-star rating. Wow. Yup. And you can actually see pictures of the house on the Airbnb website. Okay. <clears throat> it's absolutely beautiful on the inside, and I would like to eventually go there. Well, of course you would. Uh, but anyways, that's my case, Kendra. Okay. So, it's uh, it's a little interesting. I, I Like I said, I the only time I could really find anything about the history of this house and the property was from dead files. I couldn't find anything on the internet about the actual history. I was hoping to find some pretty juicy information about the house, but yeah. So, well, if uh yeah, that's my case. The people who own it don't ever want to talk. If Aaron and Aaron Clark would like to come forward and talk about their experience to get the word out so other people can be familiar with similar situations in any house. Mm -hmm. Blood, Guts, and Booze is here for you. Yes. So, yeah, that's my case. All right. Um, yeah, I think that is all for this week. All right. I think so, too. All right, guys. We will talk to you next week. See you later. Bye. Special thanks to Dylan Sears for the theme song and Sally Gunter for the cover card. Support us on Patreon and like, share, rate, and subscribe to us on all of our social media pages and your podcast stream and service. Do you have any personal stories or suggestions for the show? Email us at bloodgutsandbooze at gmail.com. 